Greetings. Father Mark signing on, continuing the course on the early modern papacy. Picking up where we left off last time, Pope Pius V died on the 1st of May, 1572, at the age of 68. The conclave of 1572 opened on May the 12th, 11 days after Pope Pius V died. 66 cardinals were eligible to participate. 53 of those made it to Rome in time to vote. The dean of the college was the same Cardinal Giovanni Moroni, who uh, served as the papal legate, bringing to completion the final period of the Council of Trent. The cardinals were divided according to the contending alliances that by now we are familiar. The first scrutiny of the conclave took place on May 13th at 6 p.m. The 70-year-old Ugo, U-G-O, Boncompagni, B-O-N-C-O-M, P-A-G, N I received all the votes except his own, as he was seen as a safe compromise candidate. He accepted election the following day, May 14th, as Pope 226, taking the papal name Gregory the 13th, under which he reigned for 13 years. Ugo Boncompagni was born in Bologna, Italy, on the 1st of January, 1501. He was the son of Cristoforo and uh, Angela. Uh, Cristoforo uh, uh, Boncompagni and his mother, Angela, was of the house of Mariscalchi. He earned a doctorate. Uh, he chose a, a career as a layman initially. He earned a doctorate in law from that city's famous university in 1530. And uh, he did so well that they hired him to, uh, to teach after. So he taught law there immediately after his graduation for the next eight years. At that point in his life, uh, still a layman, uh, no thought for ecclesiastical life, he practiced his Catholic faith in a cultural way, that's the polite way to put it, meaning that he would participate, uh, he would attend Mass on the, the major feasts, the major liturgies, Christmas, Easter, but little else. He did have a long-term extramarital relationship uh, with a, a lady named Madalena Fulcini. They had one illegitimate son, whom they named Giacomo, and uh, he claimed him, even though they weren't married. Uh, he did he did acknowledge paternity. So this was Giacomo Boncompagni. So at this point, Ugo was not impressive as a man of faith, uh, but he was well regarded as a teacher of the law. As Bologna was the premier law school of the day, uh, many important. Uh, well, men who would become important were his students, um, and these include uh, cardinal cardinals uh, Alessandro Farnese, Reginald Pole, and Saint Charles Borromeo, all of whom we've met. Ugo's life changed when the uncle of one of those students, uh, Cardinal Alessandro Farnese when his uncle became uh, Pope Paul III. When Anita rose for a reliable judge in Rome, Alessandro told uh, uncle, uncle Pope Paul that his former professor would do a good job. That thusly is history made. So in 1539, Pope Paul III offered Ugo the position and he accepted Ugo's reputation for discreet 
and competent efficiency as a judge brought him to the attention of an even wider circle of people uh, for whom he was always available to do favors. At some point between 1539 and 1545, Ugo was ordained a priest. Now it is unfortunate that no record of his personal spiritual life has survived. This prevents us from identifying the precise sequence of events. So, and, and for him, unlike some other popes, where I was able to spend a great deal of time uh, going into the background of their spiritual environment, uh, just that's the information is just not available for him. So, all we're left with is the the result. Uh, so it is known that by the time the Council of Trent opened in 1545, he attended as a priest to assist with his legal expertise. And that's really all that is known for sure. And as we've covered, the first period of Trent ended, well, not really ended, it was, it was interrupted abruptly, uh, because of the you know, the Habsburg Valois Wars, but Ugo remained part of the papal staff. He uh, was assigned as uh, to the papal legation to Paris in 1556, and then to Brussels in 1557, which, as we'll see, was uh, part of the of the Netherlands at the time. Uh, Belgium was not an independent country yet. Uh, he served as legal advisor to the Cardinal's legate. He always did his work well and therefore was punished by receiving more work. In his case, it was being named Bishop of Vieste in July of 1558. He proved to be a moderate reformer, meaning that he was in sympathy with the Tridentine movement but he was not aggressive in imposing, imposing them on lax clergy or religious houses. I mean, you know, this is a guy who had a mistress and an illegitimate child. So at least he was not, you know, was not pretending to be something he wasn't, was not pretending to be a saint. For example, uh, instead of forcibly removing a lax cleric, he preferred to wait till that guy retired uh, and then just replace him, you know, with a Tridentine-minded cleric. Personally, his time as bishop was noted for implementing two aspects of the Tridentine reforms. First, he, he, he did reside in his diocese. Uh, he never once left it uh, until obliged under obedience to attend the Council of Trent um, in the in the next the next period, the second was in terms of education, creating a school in his cathedral chapter for men seeking holy orders. So not yet a seminary, but like Cardinal Pole did in England, uh, this was you know he knew the direction that the council was going. So this was uh, like a proto a proto seminary. His contribution to the final period of Trent was in using his legal expertise as one of the bishops responsible for putting the final decrees in the proper legal form. Uh, after the council closed, he was punished for his good service by giving being given an additional responsibilities, so he was appointed to the College of Cardinals in 1565. He returned to his diocese, but was obliged once again, under obedience, to leave it to travel to Spain to take part in the Carranza trial, uh, which which we'll discuss later, because it, it just went on and on, and it was still going on when he became Pope. <clears throat> when he was elected Pope, he was elected pope because it was known everybody knew him by this point i mean they they knew he was 
that he believed in the reforms, but he was not as fearsome a personality as St. Pius V. And besides, he was 70 years old, so it was imagined that his reign would be brief and quiet. <laughs> we'll see. So they, they kind of got, they got part, I mean, they, you know, he did not change his temperament as Pope, uh, but he ended up reigning for 13 years, and his reign was anything but quiet, uh, as, as we'll see. As all kinds of th things are going to uh, happen. But to start out with a general policy, Gregory, uh, I forgot if I told you, as Pope, he took the name Gregory the Thirteenth. So as Pope, Gregory the Thirteenth believed sort of the uh, the inverse of what his predecessor Pius V believed. He said Pius V regarded the world, the secular world, as having chosen Satan to, to give its allegiance to Satan. Therefore, the church should be a, like a fortified monastery in which the faithful can find spiritual refuge. And so the, the, way, the, the way to deal with the world is we accept those who repent, but that the church is best separated from, from the world as much as possible. So Gregory believed kind of the reverse. He believed that the church... Uh, must be involved in the world and, and, and in that way convert the world from within. Uh, so to this end, Pope Gregory repurposed papal nunciatures. Uh, nunci nuncio is a, a papal ambassador, a nunciature is a papal embassy to other countries. And that he didn't invent that, that existed before him. But he, he kind of repurposed or, or not re not re it was there was still bad there was still embassies, but he uh he supplemented their responsibilities um such that the nuncio one of one of his the regular duties, a standing order of the nuncio, was to prompt the host country to fully implement the decrees of the Council of Trent and then to oversee that in an ongoing fashion. Gregory's uh, sinful youth and, well, in adulthood, uh, kept him humble. So he readily accepted the nominations for, for positions uh, from close advisors, men like St. Philip Neri and St. Charles Borromeo. Uh, so Gregory proved to be a pope like uh, Pius IV in that regard, that he, uh, he was not threatened by having people around him who were better than him at some things, you know, who, who were, uh, and in this case, spiritual things. He was not threatened by that. Or if he was, he was, he was detached enough to put that to the side and still, uh, you know, still allow them, put them in positions of authority. And that takes a lot to do. Not all, not all leaders can do that. You know, some feel threatened by having subordinates who are more talented than them and they're, and therefore just, you know, marginalize them or, you know, uh, limit them, but he, he was not one like that. He gave them full scope to use their gifts. For those individuals chosen to be nuncio then, uh, this meant uh, winning over individual sovereigns and high-ranking prelates in the host countries, as well as pursuing the draining and absolutely thankless task of forcing large groups of people who had embraced laxity to, to, to replace that by embracing discipline. So you can imagine how popular that endeavor is. So that's a general policy. Now, um, to more specific, uh, that uh, a number of historical developments occurred in Gregory's reign. Uh, we'll confine ourselves to those that influenced church history. Um, but there were many others. So first we will, um, uh, the, of course, he inherits the ongoing effects of the international anti-papal protest movement, the Protestant movement. Uh, specifically, he inherited the 80 Years' War, which was uh, another one of the many, many, many <laughs> um, 
results, characteristic results of the, of the protest movement. In each country where it manifested, uh, warfare was the result. One of the reasons this always occurred was the, the merging, the characteristic merging of political challenges to existing authority with theological demands made against the Catholic Church. And whenever religion and politics mix, nothing good happens. I mean, it, it, it invariably carnage is the result. And so the 80 years war from 1568 to 1648 is, is also, uh, by some, called the Dutch War of Independence. The merger of politics and religion, in this case, took the form of uh, Calvinist Dutch seceding from the Empire of Spain, ruled at the time by King Philip II, who we met um, a number of times. He was a, when he was still prince, he's the one that was married to Queen Mary I of England. Spain uh, was the most Catholic country in Europe at that, at that time. Uh, you know, for those of you who are, you may think Italy, but uh, Italy was remember Italy was not a country at that. Italy was divided, in, so Spain was you know was a unified country at that point, uh, and also at that point it included Portugal. So the whole peninsula was united because of a marriage alliance. So Spain was the most Catholic country in Europe at the time. It was completely untouched by the protest movement. Hence, uh, political demands inevitably entwined with theological denunciations. So the sequence of events uh, leading to the bloodbath have been developing in the background of other material we've covered. But, and that's always a problem with, the, the, you know, so many of these things happen at the same time. You know, it's, it's what makes it hard to, to teach, but... Uh, many many of the the turning points happened during Gregory's reign, so that's why I'm you know you know kind of bringing them to attention now. So there will be some rewinding uh, historically, but but leading up to to events in Gregory's reign. So with this in mind, um, on the fifth of January, fourteen seventy seven, uh, Charles, the Duke of uh, of Burgundy uh, died at, at a battle of, of Nancy, uh, and he, he left his lands to his only child, who was a daughter, Duchess uh, Marie de Valois Burgundy. On August 19th, 1477, so eight months later, she married Archduke Maximilian von Habsburg, at Ghent. She married him instead of the heir to the throne of France, who would be, he was prince, but he would be the future King Charles VIII. So she married a Habsburg instead of a Valois. This triggered three centuries of warfare between the French and the Austrians for control over her territories. Now, we won't follow all of that because at the time, those were both Catholic countries. That was before the protest movement. So fast forwarding, Marie's grandson was the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, whom we met you know, many times. He squandered uh, many lives and resources in wars against the Valois for control of her territory. Now the nomenclature of her territory is is uh, it can be confusing. Uh, in 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 general, the the region was called the Netherlands, but it's more complicated than that. 
So uh, the Habsburg maps of the Holy Roman Empire identified let's see, identified the region. Actually, I don't want to. Let me do this. Okay, so um, on on t- this is on today's maps. See uh, Holland, Belgium, Luxembourg are are three different countries, but that was not the case uh, for Marie's lands, and therefore that. Didn't. So this whole region in in this in the early modern time period. When uh, people said the Netherlands, they they were were referring to the whole thing, and even some parts of eastern France. Um, uh, so the the Battle of Nancy is up here, where uh, you know where Charles Duke Charles died. So here you have uh, in uh, let's see Amsterdam up here. So that's uh, Holland, and then. Down here, you have Brussels, present-day Belgium, and then the Netherlands, I mean, and then Luxembourg. And so then you have Germany and France over here. So this whole region, uh, the Netherlands. All right. So uh, on the Habsburg maps of their Holy Roman Empire. That whole region I just pointed to, uh, they, they, they use the Latin word Belgica, which was borrowed from the ancient Roman maps, although that whole region did not correspond to the way the ancient Romans, you, you know, refer to the Belgica. But anyway, that, that's what the Holy Roman, that they did. So by the early modern period, uh, most people were, knew the region as the Habsburg Netherlands, because they controlled it, or they called it the Low Countries, meaning low in elevation, as the uh, continental shelf sloped downward toward the North Sea. When the Emperor Charles V abdicated, we saw that he divided the empire uh, between the Austrian and the Spanish branches branches of the Habsburg dynasty. Marie's ancestral holdings that were divided into 17 provinces described from 1556 onward as the Spanish Netherlands because it fell to the Spanish branch of the Habsburgs, meaning Philip II. So he was king of Spain, but he he was also a Habsburg. He you know was Charles V's fifth son. Um, but but the the even though the Netherlands are not contiguous with Spain, they were you know it was part of that of the Spanish holding. So the Spanish Netherlands. So um, by this time, however, the operation of the protest movement, the Protestant movement, was such that Holland. The, you know, part of part of the Netherlands that we call Holland was largely Calvinist. You know, the Dutch Reformed Church, as, as they would say. While the area of the Netherlands that we call Belgium and Luxembourg remained mostly Catholic. Now, that's a general statement, but, but the situation on the ground was far more complex with religiously and ethnically mixed populations in most of the towns and cities. The resulting tension periodically erupted during the Protestant movement into recurring cycles of religious vandalism, as we saw from the beginning in Germany and Switzerland. In, uh, in, the, in the Netherlands history, these had their own name, uh, Bildenstorm. It's a Dutch... Uh, means uh, image storm or statue storm, spelled B-E-E-L-D-E-N, and then storm, S-T-O. 
O-R-M. Um, now, those happened, that's from the beginning. So the, the building storm uh, happened as early as 1522 in the Netherlands, as we saw as early as 1519 in Switzerland. But the, the one that's significant for, for this, this cycle of history we're talking about was the building storm that occurred between August and October of 1566. Significant because it was the proximate trigger for the 80 Years' War in the history of the Netherlands. And as we'll see, that it, it drew in many other countries beyond the Netherlands because you see where it is. The Netherlands is. It's, it shares a border with France and Germany. And then, and then one of its borders is the, is the North Sea, which, of course, is going to affect England, which is right on, on the other side of it. <clears throat> um, so on August the 10th, August 10th, is the Feast of St. Lawrence, the Deacon and Martyr. King Philip II of Spain was known to have a particular devotion to St. Lawrence as the monastery which provided the sacramental service for his one of his palaces, the Escorial, near Madrid, um, was under the patronage of St. Lawrence. So a pilgrimage took place uh, in the Netherlands. I mean, well, pilgrimages took, all, took place all over, but the, the one that's relevant here a pilgrimage in honor of the state saint took place in the Netherlands from to, from one town to another, from Handschut to Steenvoort, just, you know, two towns in the Netherlands. Uh, it was shadowed by mocking protesters, the Protestant protesters, shouting accusations, the usual that, you know, we're Catholics or pagans, that we, we're, we worship idols, uh, so screaming that, you know, the, the, the uh, at, at the people in the procession. And they shadowed them all, all the way during the procession. So this, of course, emotions are going to, you know, rise over this. And it culminated in a, in a riot. It started a few fistfights, and then it, it's, it erupted into a riot. In the course of which, the sacred art in the chapel of St. Lawrence was either destroyed or stolen if it was movable, like the gold candlesticks, chalices, monstrance, those things were just stolen to be melted down. But others, like the statues we smashed, or at least the head was defaced, stained glass windows were shattered. Now, so now whether or not what followed was planned or not, you know, whether this whole thing was staged in the beginning, or whether it was just harassment that got out of hand, remains a point of dispute. But sequentially, there's no doubt that this was the first outbreak of a wave of such episodes of rioting, vandalism of sacred art, theft of church property, arson, at times assault, and even murder. Some people died. Uh, church personnel who resisted, tried to protect you know, the church churches. The rioting reached Antwerp by August 20th, Ghent by August 22nd. In Ghent alone, the cathedral, eight churches, 25 monasteries and convents, 10 hospitals, and seven chapels, uh, shrines, chapels, were, were wrecked. By the, by the vandals. The wave of this building storm reached Amsterdam, which I showed you, this is in the north, uh, by August 23rd, Maastricht by September 20th, Venlo by October 5th, this, this just went on for months, and many more. So in Flanders alone, 400 churches were destroyed. Activities, uh, you know, included, uh, as we saw in Switzerland and Germany in our previous outbreaks, uh, arson, theft, desecration, vandalism, assault, murder. The cultural damage and the loss of, of the region's artistic heritage is, is, is beyond calculation. 
Now, to be fair, there were some, some Protestants were horrified at this. Even if they agreed with the rioters that, that Catholic sacred art was idolatry, they nevertheless feared such widespread disregard for property rights and public order. Yet many Protestant ministers found themselves boxed in by their own past rhetoric. After decades of reviling Catholic art, uh, sacred art as paganism and idolatry and satanic, how could they then condemn their followers for doing this? They say, well, okay, you, you, you told us that this is, these are pagan idols. And paganism is satanic. So, what's wrong with what's wrong with shattering that? What's wrong with destroying that? Furthermore, many such preachers appeared surprised when rioting expanded, and these building storm the rioters, and they started destroying non-Catholic structures. Just started destroying any you know anything in their heightened emotional condition of lawlessness. As we saw earlier, decades earlier, what, 40 years earlier, Luther had found himself in the same difficulty in the Peasants' War in Germany. You know, and saying, oh, you know, Catholics are evil, this is satanic, and all this. Uh, and then, okay, well, then the peasants take believe you and, and, and start doing, well, the logical thing. Okay, if this stuff is satanic, we should destroy it. And then, oh, you're just shocked, you know. And and so again and again, nobody learns. As Thomas More he phrased it so well, you, you you cannot push a man off a cliff and tell him to stop halfway down. You know, or you you light a match. I mean, you never know. You know, and then the forest fire. You know, and then it gets out of control. So this condition of panic over the collapse of public order enabled. Uh, uh, brings into our story Margaret of Parma. She was a half-sister of King Philip II of Spain, and she was functioning. He had appointed her as the Habsburg regent, or a governor, essentially, of the Netherlands, of the Spanish Netherlands. So in this case, the, the, the rioting, the collapse of public order, uh, she summoned Catholic and Protestant leaders to meet in Brussels on August 23rd. They ostensibly agreed to cooperate in ending the violence. In exchange, the the Protestant leaders said, "Well, well, you know, we'll help you, but in exchange, we want to guarantee the of the of freedom of worship and immunity from the Inquisition for Protestants." Now, in this case, most of them are Calvinists, but it you know it would it would apply uh, the protections would apply for all those you know, who are protesting, part of the, you know, the protest movement against the papacy, against Catholicism. She agreed, and she entrusted uh, command, military command of the restoration of peace to William of Orange. He's called William the Silent in the, in this, the histories of the period to distinguish him from his more famous descendant, William of Orange, who became William III, King of England. So this guy, William the Silent, was the eldest son of Count William of Nassau, Dillenburg. In 1544, his first cousin, the Prince of Orange, died, leaving him as heir. And therefore, he becomes the founder of the dynasty, the house of, of Orange Nassau. Okay, so I should, uh, you're, you're hearing the word orange. It, yes, it is, it's orange, O-R-A-N-G-E. And, and just, this is confusing on so many levels. First, because it's not even in the Netherlands. It's not even close to the Netherlands. It's, it's actually in south, southeastern France. Uh, about 13 miles north of Avignon. So, uh, in the in the empire, the the, the Roman Empire, uh, this this was the uh, Arusio, A R A U S I O. It had nothing to do with the fruit 
the orange. Arusio was the name of a river god. And then they, the Romans founded a colony there. Um, you know, so the uh, Julian colony of Arusio was established by veterans of the Second Legion. So the, it was originally unrelated to the fruit, uh, but later was conflated with it. Uh, so orange, you know, the, the, the Arusio, then after the empire fell, the name remained and became orange. The, uh, the, the, um, the prince of orange, the princes of orange, adopted the color of an orange on their flags, on their sigils. So that's how the color and that, that, that all became conflated. And because William the Silent and later his descendant, who becomes William the Third, King of England, uh, became leaders of the protest movement, uh, that's how the color orange came to be associated with Protestantism. As, you know, for example, in Irish history, the orange men, those are the Protestants. You know, orange is a Protestant color, green was the Catholic color. Okay, so uh, in 1559, King Philip II of Spain appointed William the Silent as Stadtholder, which is a governor, Dutch term for governor, of the provinces of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht within the Spanish Netherlands. So the Spanish Netherlands was 17 provinces, and this guy was made governor of three of them. Now, though William the Silent received his entire education from the Catholic Church, he nevertheless turned on the Catholic Church and uh, initially embraced Lutheranism. He did this without the knowledge of Margaret of Parma, who was the, the senior governor of the, of the Spanish Netherlands. She, not knowing his sympathies, just assuming he was Catholic, because you know, externally he was, uh, she appointed him to take over the military operations to quell the rioting of the building storm of 1566. He turned on her, and he turned on the church. And this transforming this uh, building storm, which was initially an anti-Catholic outburst, into a nationalist war of secession of that the, the Netherlands, the Dutch specifically, uh, wanted to secede, the Protestant Dutch wanted to secede from the Spanish Empire. So that's how this which began as a religious war, a religious uprising, became combined with a war for, for Dutch independence. And that's that's always that's always the case with the Protestant movement. These, 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 you know, the the religious becomes merged with the political. The first field battle, you know, as opposed to just the vandalism and the you know the rioting, the first actual battle occurred uh, near Antwerp in what is now Belgium on March thirteenth, fifteen sixty seven. Estimates range to over 100,000 killed in this uh, war, although calculation is difficult to separate because of other overlapping conflicts during the wars of religion and because of where the Netherlands was that would get involved in many of these others, like the French wars of religion, which we covered previously and which we're going to cover again, and then the Thirty Years' War, which is going to happen in the future. A perennial difficulty in such conflicts, uh, a parallel version of which we covered during an earlier visit to Scotland, was that Catholics were not all of one mind as to the ideal outcome. Religiously, of course, they wanted their region, their country, to remain Catholic. But politically, there were many Catholics in the Netherlands, not just the Dutch, you know, but there were many Catholics in the Netherlands who preferred, who would have preferred independence, you know, nationalist aspirations, would have preferred that their region be independent instead of continuing under provincial status within the Habsburg Dominion. Therefore, 
at times during this Eighty Years' War, moderate Calvinist and moderate Catholics united forces for political reasons against Catholic Spain. Conversely, extremist elements among Calvinists and Catholics sought to sabotage any such cooperation, regardless of the political ramifications, in favor of achieving total victory by eradicating the other side, you know, the other religious polity. One example of this confusion brought Pope Gregory the Thirteenth into the conflict. It involved the city of Ghent, G H E N T. Now, uh, Ghent is the second largest city in the Kingdom of Belgium, but then. It was in the county of Flanders, which so it was just one part of the Netherlands, of the Spanish Netherlands. On October 28, 1577, Calvinists carried out a coup d'etat, successfully taking over the city council of Ghent with the support of William the Silent, who, remember, was supposed to be, <laughs> was supposed to be in service to the Spanish crown. Or the governor, you know, the Margaret, uh, the Duchess of Parma, who was uh, representing the, the Spanish crown, but had had gone over to the other side in favor of um, political independence uh, with with Calvinist supremacy or Protestant uh, uh, supremacy. Uh, so uh, Calvinists then. Since that, that worked in Ghent, they, they then carried out a similar takeover in Brussels, now is the capital of Belgium. Then it was in the Duchy of Brabant. In the course of this, the, they arrested the bishops of Bruges and Ypres as traitors, meaning that they supported remaining in the Habsburg Empire. You see, so... That even the, the, these bishops, you know, they wanted to stay in the Habsburg and the Spanish Habsburg Empire for religious reasons, but but these the the the, the Calvinists, you know, who arrested them and considered them traitors, said, "Well, okay, you would rather you would rather us be subordinate to a foreign power, so then you're you're a traitor to the national cause." He says, "He, I mean, you see how." You know, how, how dare you? How could you possibly prefer us to be subordinate to a foreign power rather than independence for ourselves? So you see how these political and religious, they, they it, it, it just it complicates things <clears throat> in, a, in a homicidal direction. From this nucleus, the Calvinist version of the independence movement grew and attracted like-minded religious affiliates who, who, you know, in some cases, went to go fight with them as allies, uh, including Scottish Presbyterians, English Puritans, and French Huguenots. Inevitably, another building storm took place, this one at Ghent the following year in May of 1578. Monks and clergy were rounded up and tortured to obtain confessions as traitors. Again, defined in this context by supporting continued Spanish Catholic Habsburg control of the Netherlands. And these were executed by incineration. This atrocity pushed Catholics, many Catholics, even those who wanted political independence from the Habsburgs, to, to now to switch and support the Habsburgs as their only hope for personal safety. In, in, the, in the midst of this disintegration of public order. Pope Gregory XIII intervened at this point in the situation to negotiate the Union Dara. The Union uh, D, you know, of D apostrophe A R R A S. It's a place. 
in May of 1579. This was a defensive alliance of Catholics from Utrecht and Ghent, along with Catholics representing the county of Artois, the county of Aino, and the city of Douai. Others joined in as the war continued. With Pope Gregory mediating, they signed the Treaty of Arras with Spain. So all those I mentioned, those are all within the Netherlands. So now they formally, even though they're technically they're part of the Spanish Empire, but because the Civil War is going on and the War of Independence is going on, they're committing to remain loyal to Spain in, in, in exchange for, you know, for the perpetuation and defense of Catholicism. Uh, so the treaty with Spain, uh, so the Union of so Gregory brought together the Union of Arras, and then mediated between that Union and Philip to sign a treaty with Spain on May seventeenth, fifteen seventy nine, which pledged Netherland Catholics to perpetuating Habsburg dominions, dominion, thereby delaying the creation of an independent kingdom of Belgium until 1830. But when it did become a kingdom, it was it was a Catholic kingdom. It still is one of the few Catholic monarchies left in the world. <clears throat> okay, so we'll leave that and just know that for the reign of the next several popes, this the 80 years war is going to be in the background. And we'll see it spill over into some other things we cover. Uh, now to the, let's see, to the other side. Let me pause this for a minute to get the map. Okay. So now, uh, the next, uh, we're going to the opposite end uh, of to, to Eastern Europe uh, for some development. So here's today's maps. We, we have Russia, we have the Baltic states, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, Poland, and uh, uh, Ukraine, and uh, yeah, okay. So in terms of some of the cities I'm going to mention, uh, here's Moscow, Russia. Up here is Novgorod. I know that's not it's it's not you know, something we refer to commonly today. Moscow is more famous, but as you'll see. Moscow only happened really because of Novgorod. Um, now in uh, Ukraine is Kiev. Which we're going to mention also. And uh, Poland, present day Poland. Here's uh, Warsaw. So you see Warsaw to Kiev. And uh, uh, Minsk is in present day Belarus. And uh, Vilnius, is that yeah, Vilnius? That's in uh, Lithuania. Now, uh, these borders have changed many times uh, over history. So I'm going to be referring to grand duchies, uh, which were uh, smaller, the smaller nuclei of what became these states. So there was the grand duchy of uh, Novgorod, of Kiev, of Moscow. Uh, of Lithuania, of Poland. Uh, then at different times they became kingdoms, they merged, they conquered each other, and so it went back and forth. So, But the cities remained, so that's why I you know, focus on the cities. Okay, so and down, uh, uh, this is the Black Sea. Down here is the Black Sea, and this is the Crimea. All right, to, or to orient yourself uh, there. Okay, now, uh, with that uh, visually in place, Catholicism in Eastern Europe experienced the turning point in its history during the reign of Pope Gregory XIII. Now, we've already covered uh, in previous uh, lectures the uh, Eastern Europe under attack from Islam, from the Ottoman Turks, from the southeast up the Danube River uh, Valley. Oh, 
I closed it. Well, I should say that while we see have it all at the same time. Okay, so here's uh, uh, the Black Sea from the uh, from the side. Oh, let's see. This. So uh, we saw the Black Sea on the other map from up here, and now here's the Black Sea from the side, and uh, the Danube River empties into the Black Sea. And the Danube goes all the way through in southeastern Europe. So the Turks, the Ottoman Turks, had, uh, we saw previously, taken uh, Belgrade, Serbia, yeah. Uh, that's uh, Belgrade in Serbia. All the way, all the way up to Budapest in Hungary. And then uh, up here on the top is Poland and Ukraine. So to orient from the uh, previous map, and we saw that from we saw more of it from the the northern to the north. But here's the southern part, uh, Poland and uh, in Ukraine. Yeah, here, uh, Poland, Pol Ukraine, and Poland. So, uh, Eastern Europe was under uh, military pressure uh, from the southeast up the Danube River, as well as from uh, Lutheran Protestants to the west in Germany. The next category of crisis came from the east, from the emerging state of Russia. Now, Russia, uh, like Italy at this point, was not was not yet a single nation. Uh, so to understand this, we have to catch up with the Vikings and the Mongols. In Eastern European and Greek chronicles, the Scandinavian invaders called that called Vikings in the West, were described as Varangians, V-A-R-A-N-G-I-A-N, and then add an S for plural. Among their number were marauders from Roslagen, that is east, eastern coastal Sweden. From that, Roslagen, so uh, the Varangians were the general term in the, in the East for the Vikings. A, a, a subset of the Vikings were those from Sweden, present-day Sweden. A subset of those were from Roslagen in Sweden. And because of linguistic sloth, you know, this, the history of language is sloth, so there's always contraction. So Roslagen is the origin of the word Rus. R-U-S, the Rus. <clears throat> in 862, one chieftain of the Rus named Roriker, uh, in, for there in the Scandinavian uses, that's H-R-O-R-I-K-R. -R -R. In 862, he seized control of Lake Lagoda, L A G. O D A and constructed a fortress called Holmgard, one point two miles south of Novgorod, which I showed you on that map, way up in the north. Novgorod just means new town, uh, along the Volkov River. All right, eight sixty two AD Roriker seizes Lake Lagoda, constructs a fortress of home guard, which gives him control of Novgorod. In Russian history, this guy, Rorikar, is remembered as Rurik, R-U-R-I-K, Rurik, Rurik the Rus. Uh, Rurik died in 879. He was followed as Prince of Novgorod by a relative named Oleg. Oleg continued expanding south from Novgorod. He murdered, assassinated, the rulers of Kiev in present-day Ukraine, 
on the Naipur River, making himself Grand Prince of the Kievan Rus. That, that whole totality, the Kievan Rus, is the antecedent of the present countries of Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. All pagan at this point. In 957 AD, Saint Olga, O-L-G-A, Olga of Kiev, was the first grand princess of the Kievan Rus to accept baptism as a Christian. She was the wife of Igor. Igor was the grandson of Rurikar, or Rurik, Rurik the Rus, of Novgorod. She, Oleg, uh, Olga, was baptized through the Greeks in Constantinople. So Russian Orthodoxy would follow the Eastern Orthodox after the schism in 1054 rather than Roman Catholic. I mean, they're Christian, but Orthodox rather than Roman Catholic. So this principality of the Kievan Rus, uh, sort of the cultural cradle of that that part of uh, the Slavic world, was conquered by the Mongol Golden Horde. I know we covered the Mongols earlier, or maybe not in this course, but in the media course we certainly did. Uh, initially they were pagan. Uh, Mongolia is north of China. Uh, but they're not ethnically Chinese. It's a completely different ethnic group, different language, different culture, different history. Um, originally, they were pagan. They worshipped the sky, Tengri, the sky. Later, they converted to Islam. So uh, the principality of the Kievan Rus was conquered by the Mongol Golden Horde in a series of wars that began with a Varangian defeat by the Mongols at the Battle of the Kalka River in May of 1223. The decisive phase of the conflict commenced when a Mongol army of 40,000 mounted archers crossed the Volga River in 1236. Ryazan and Vladimir fell to the Mongols in November of 1237. Kolomna and Moscow were incinerated in 1238. Fourteen additional cities that resisted were conquered and destroyed by the Mongols. Novgorod saved itself a similar fate by preemptive surrender. Kiev chose to fight, but was stormed by the Mongols in December of 1240, ending the principality as an independent realm. For a very, very long time. Russia then became part of the Mongol Empire, Russia in the sense of the land of the Rus, you know, those those Varangians who settled in that region, became part of the Mongol Empire. So many of these cities like Moscow were rebuilt, but they were vassals to the to the Mongols. Uh, it remained subordinate for at least two centuries and in some parts of uh, what later became Russia, three centuries. The process of Russian recovery and assertion of independence, you know, proto-nationalism, began with the rise, or the second rise, so to speak, of the, of the, of the Grand Duchy of Moscow, created as a vassal to the Mongol Empire in 1263. Two centuries later, Ivan III Vasilyevich, this is Ivan the Great in Russian history. He's the grandfather of Ivan the Terrible. But this is, who's Ivan the Fourth? But this is Ivan the Third, Ivan the Great. Uh, he succeeded his father, Vasily II, as Grand Duke in 1462. Ivan found himself in a situation would have, which would have baffled many, many men but which he was able to turn to nationalist and dynastic opportunity and thereby change Russian history. First, Novgorod and other Orthodox duchies and principalities in Russia 
chose to ally themselves with Catholic duchies to the west of Lithuania and Poland in order to achieve independence from the Islamic Mongol horde. Initially, Ivan ingratiated himself with the Mongols by fighting for the Mongols, for the Muslims, against his fellow Christians and succeeding uh, by crushing uh, that, that alliance. The, um, and he was rewarded, as he knew he would be. The Mongols rewarded him by granting him more territory. Uh, he was already Grand Prince of, uh, well, Grand Duke initially, of Moscow. So as a result of these success, successfully fighting on their behalf, the Mongols endowed him with the principalities of Yaroslav, Rostov, Novgorod, Ver, and Vyatka. All that over a period of between 1463 and 1489. Second, uh, it, and despite sharing the Islamic faith, the Mongol horde and the Ottoman Turks came into conflict over expansionist ambitions in Hungary and Bulgaria. Like who was going to control the Danube, you know, and and then and then after controlling it, cross it into Europe. So now here, Ivan plays the same game, but you know, in, in, in reverse, he offered his services to the Ottomans against the Mongols. And with each success, the Ottomans rewarded him with money and with a portion of reconquered territory. Third. When Ivan was age 13 in 1453, and his father, Vasily II, was still reigning as Grand Duke of Moscow, the Ottoman Turks captured Constantinople, ending the Byzantine Empire and renaming the city Istanbul, which it remains today. It's still the uh, uh, Turkey, the nation of Turkey. The last Byzantine emperor, Constantine the Eleventh died in the fighting. His brother was named Thomas uh, Palaeologus. That was the name of the of their dynasty. Uh, P a l a e o l o g u s. Uh, brother Thomas claimed the title of emperor after Constantine died in the in the fighting but was in fact just one among thousands and thousands of, of refugee Greek Christians who fled. Some fled north to Russia, others fled west to Europe. Brother Thomas had a daughter named Zoe, who also escaped. She happened to be unmarried. With Constantinople fallen, and with the other eastern patriarchal seas long before having fallen to Islam, as we covered in previous courses at Jerusalem, Antioch, Alexandria. Eastern Christianity then had no focal point now that, now that Constantinople was also gone. Pope Paul II perceived in this an opportunity to end the schism of 1054. When he learned through merchants and Eastern European bishops of Ivan's successful expansion, he thought he found one solution to two problems. The ancient city of Kiev was the origin place of Christianity among the Rus. By the reign of Paul II, Kiev had been absorbed by Ivan, and it, you know, it was a vassal to the Grand Duchy of Moscow, making it uh, functionally, well, not, not, not just functionally, I mean, it, it was part of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. It was still the Grand Duchy, I mean, but it, it, it was a feudal thing. So, I mean, it still had its position, but it was under the control of, of Ivan. In 1467, Ivan's first wife, Mariska of Dver, died. So Pope Paul II proposed that the refugee Byzantine princess Zoe, 
marry Ivan. So Moscow would inherit the senior Eastern Orthodox position, from which Pope Paul hoped he would be able to negotiate with Ivan an end to the schism, meaning reuniting with Rome. So a smooth plan, but Ivan, Ivan the Great was not one to be used by anyone. Instead, he used the Pope to facilitate the marriage because that was to his advantage. But instead, but in, he insisted that she become Russian Orthodox, and she even changed her name uh, to, to Sophie, uh, Sophie, Sophia before the marriage took place in 1469. Otherwise, Ivan did indeed assume for himself the mantle of protector of Orthodox Christianity and claimed to be the political heir of the Byzantine Empire. He adopted the Byzantine double-headed eagle as his totemic sigil. He invited engineers and architects from the West to renovate, fortify, and expand the Kremlin in Moscow, where Kremlin just means fortress, because that, you know, obviously that's, this guy's ambitions weren't done yet, you know, so he, he you know, and, the, and it, so he needed a fortress. Um, and Ivan the Third, Ivan the Great, is the first ruler in the history of the Rus to use the title Tsar, which was the Slavic rendering of Caesar, indicating his imperial claim that he's the actual successor of the Byzantine emperors. And his propaganda began referring to Moscow as the Third Rome. You know, that was the first Rome, the real one in Italy. Then Constantinople was the second Rome, so now Moscow is the third Rome. By 1476, Ivan felt ready to take the biggest risk of his reign thus far. He repudiated the vassal tribute to the Mongol Khan Ahmed. So all of this time, he's been playing multiple, you know, multiple games but still paying the tribute to the Mongols, you know, so that so they wouldn't realize what he was up to. So in 1476, he does the deed, which is going to tip him off. And, of course, that would mean war. Slaughter continued for four years, culminating with the Battle of the Ugra River on November 11, 1480, which proved to be both a tactical and a strategic victory for Ivan and a turning point in Russian history the Mongol Golden Horde collapsed. Whereupon Ivan then, then turned, he reversed and went on the, on the attack um, to, and completely inverted the former situation and such that seven years later, after another seven years of fighting, by 1487, only two fragments were left of the original Mongol Golden Horde empire within what we think of as Russia. Uh, One was the Khanate of Kazan. The other was the Khanate of Crimea. In 1487, they both accepted vassalage. (laughs) They both accepted being vassals to Ivan and paying tribute to Ivan. So that's, you know, uh, uh, so that's why is Ivan the Great in Russian history. By 1495, the Ottoman Turks accepted the new reality, and they accepted ambassadors from Muscovy, as they called it, the, from the Grand Duchy of Moscow, uh, acknowledging him as the legitimate sovereign of the region. Okay, so now catching up to Pope Gregory the Thirteenth In 1581, Pope Gregory the Thirteenth dispatched a diplomat, a cardinal, Antonio Pasavino, to once again attempt a reunion with the Russian between the Roman Catholic and the Russian Orthodox. Now, the the Russian Orthodox clergy were were to you know that they they would not have ever considered submission to the Pope, and if, if Ivan had wanted to do it, it would have required you know a great deal of force to impose it on his population, and, and but he didn't want to do it, so he wasn't going to do it. Nevertheless, Pasavino was able to negotiate a treaty between Russia and Poland that made the Tsar favorably disposed toward him. 
And then we're going to catch up with Poland and Lithuania uh, shortly to understand why that was a why it was advantageous to Ivan. And since since this representative of the Pope was able to do that for him, Ivan uh, uh, then rewarded him by granting Roman Catholics freedom of worship in his realm. But that's as far as he would go. You know, he, he would not let them proselytize, like they could not seek converts. Uh, but those who were visiting from the West could could worship in their way uh, in his realm. Ivan III's uh, expansionist policy prompted a historical development to his West. It's still Eastern Europe from the Pope's perspective, uh, which would bring together several historical paths that we've been following. And to understand all the connections, uh, we have to return to the Duchy of Milan in northern Italy. And another marriage. You know, we saw that one of the, the feudalism problems, you know, was uh, the families just deciding sacraments of vocation for their kids, whether they're going to become priests or nuns or, or marry total strangers. Uh, so in this case, it's a marriage. On February 2nd, 1494, a lady named Bona, B-O-N-A, Svorza, S-F-O-R-Z-A. Uh, and yes, it's the same family we covered earlier. Uh, Bona was born in Vigevano. Remember that Dominican base? We covered that in a previous, uh, previous uh, lecture. She was the third of the four children born to Duke Jean Galeazzo Sforza and his wife, Isabella, who was uh, one of the daughters of King Alfonso II. So she was of the house of Trastamara, the Spanish house. Her teachers included, bonus teachers, I mean, uh, included Italian humanists who taught her mathematics, science, geography, history, law, Latin, uh, classical literature, as well as several musical instruments. So a typical Renaissance education, at least for those, you know, from wealthy, wealthy families, which the, the Sforza, the Dukes of Milan certainly were. This uh, Bona was destined to play a role in Eastern Europe, believe it or not, analogous to that of Catherine de Medici in the West, who was also a feudalism marriage. We covered several sessions back. She was married into the French royal uh, royalty. But sticking with Bona Sforza, on October 2nd, 1515, the Queen of Poland died, Queen Barbara, leaving the king, Sigismund I, a widower. He was king, he was both king of Poland as well as Grand Duke of Lithuania. Uh, but there were two separate titles, so it, it just happened to be that he personally, that the same guy held both titles. But at this point, the two titles were separate, and the two jurisdictions were separate in terms of law. Uh, Bona Sforza's father was already deceased, but her mother, Isabella, was still alive. And she remained Duchess of Bari and Rosano in her own right, by, by inheritance. She took the initiative of sending an embassy to King Sigismund I successfully convincing him to marry Bona, making her daughter Bona the next queen of Poland. This occurred for the same reasons, the same dynamic, that prompted the French, the House of Valois, to agree that uh, the earlier French king, Henri II, would marry the Italian uh, Catherine de' Medici. It's the same reason that, that both they wanted access to the gold of Italian banks as well as use of the international commercial and information network that these Italian banks maintained. Isabella, to put some numbers to this, Isabella sent Bona with a dowry of 100,000 gold ducats. Now that's not 100,000 in paper money. That's 100,000 gold coins. Plus, Bona 
uh, had no brother, so she would inherit the duchies of Bari and Rossano when her mother Isabel died. In return, Bona would become Queen of Poland and Grand Duchess of Lithuania as soon at the marriage. And the Poles, the king, the king of Poland, endowed her up front with eight Polish towns, even if the marriage remained childless. And it, it did not, as we'll see. They did have children. So Bona's wedding and coronation took place on April 18th, 1518. The Pope at the time was a Medici, was Giovanni de' Medici, Pope Leo X, with whom Bona, she knew him personally, you know, the Sforza and the Medici's, and, uh, and, you know, she had long been acquainted with him, and they corresponded together. When she got to Poland, she recognized instantly that a long-term threat to Roman Catholicism in Poland, as well as the surrounding Eastern Europe, was encroachment from the Orthodox in Russia. Now, they could only encroach because Ivan you know, was militarily expansionist, and, and they, would, of course, would follow you know, wherever Ivan expanded. So, uh, with that in mind, and being so far away that he could not practically intervene, Pope Leo, on January 23rd, 1519, entrusted Bona with de facto, not canonical, but de facto nomination of 15 Polish benefices, including five cathedrals. And that included the Cathedral of, of Krakow and Poznan and Nizno, the you know historic sees in Poland, meaning that he relied on her to recommend to him Catholic prelates, you know, guys who really were Catholic, who really did love the faith. Poland at the time... Uh, was a monarchy, unlike Bona's native Italy. As we saw, Italy was not united at this point. Yet, in other respects, apart from being a monarchy, the political situation in Poland and Lithuania turned out to be quite familiar to her. The aristocracy of Poland had retained a, an exceptionally high degree of autonomy, which kept the monarch, the king of Poland, far weaker than his counterparts of the period, the monarchs of Spain, France, Portugal, and England. These same aristocrats maintained armed retainers, which were functionally dozens of private armies used to wage internecine warfare against each other. For various reasons. I mean, not not because of the faith, you know, just, you know, for ambition, for theft, control, you know, all the usual excuses. So this this dangerously slowed Poland's political and economic centralization and, and explained much of the suffering Poland would later endure at the hands of surrounding countries that were not so, that were not slowed in that way. So apart from the titles used, this, this was exactly the situation that Bona grew up with in Italy. You know, all these, these contending, ambitious rival houses. Hers was one of them. The Sforza was, was one of them, as we saw in previous uh, courses, previous lectures. So she knew exactly what her husband needed to do. Using the mountain of gold that came as her dowry, um, they began purchasing land for the family. Now, since it was family money, it was not money from the treasury, you know, which, which was controlled by the parliament of Poland, but instead was their personal money, so they didn't have to account to anyone. And any land purchase belonged to their family, not to the crown. She organized these newly acquired properties um, according to the Chinese three-field crop rotation that had not yet been introduced in Eastern Europe. She did it. She's the one that introduced it to Eastern Europe. But it had been known in Italy already for generations because of the, their trade with the East. As applied in Poland and Lithuania, it was called the Volok Reform, V-O-L-O-K. And it, it achieved Bona's intent of quadrupling royal revenue just in her lifetime. 
The way this was done, the land was measured and divided into volocks. Voloch was a unit, a unit of land. Uh, of uh, it, it, it depends on what source you use, whether it's European or American. So if you read about in European sources, they use metrics. So they, it's 21.38 hectares. In, uh, in English, you know, in American and English writings, it would be 52.8 acres. The reform began in 1547. Its success meant being economic, you know, as, as well as just agriculturally, and it, it had to produce more food, uh, meant that it was soon imitated throughout Eastern Europe. So the, the, the land around the manor was set apart as a, a full walk. That's, you know, was, was the Grand Duke's part. Uh, the surveyors attempted to, to make all the Volox rectangles. Now, of course, you know, topography doesn't always allow that to be precise, but that was the goal. Uh, and it was divided. Each, each of these rectangles would be divided into three fields as equal, you know, as the topography permitted to facilitate the three-field crop rotation. Each field was then divided into strips, into three strips. Um, so the the rotation, uh, the arable land, uh, would in the three the three the three fields would be uh, one would be planted in the autumn with a winter crop with wheat and rye. A second field was planted with other crops, depending on the soil, peas or lentils or beans, while the third would be left fallow, would be unplanted, but would still be used because, uh, uh, you know, weeds and grass would naturally grow. So the animals on the farm would then graze on that third field. So the field would be used, just not used to grow things. Uh, and so the animals eating the grass would naturally fertilize that vacant field as the culmination of, shall we say, the digestive process. The reason this worked uh, is that the cereal crops deplete the ground of nitrogen, but the legumes replenish the nitrogen. So, you know, that helps the soil. And then they'd, they'd, they'd rotate it. You know, so like the, the, like the same field would not be used sequentially for the wheat and rye it would be you know it would be so like the next so that that field and the next cycle would be left fallow and you know instead it would go that way rotate that way uh in this way queen bona grew dynastic wealth giving the royal family a measure of independence from the polish parliament not complete uh, but the wealth did enable them to purchase more estates, hire more armed retainers, and then actually just start buying uh, uh, estates from uh, impoverished nobles. So that they ended up, uh, they were doing this in Lithuania, because uh, you know the, the nobles in Lithuania were not as powerful or not as attentive uh, about, as those in Poland. So not only did, did they have the title Grand Duke and Duchess of Lithuania, but they actually actually owned as a family significant swaths of land in Lithuania from purchase. Now, as it turned out, uh, the marriage was not childless. She had seven pregnancies. Two of her children died in infancy, but of the rest, they, you know, they were used, in, you know, as, as in the feudalism, you know, the feudalism paradigm for alliances. So uh, one daughter, the oldest daughter, was named for Bona's mother, Isabella. Uh, she was married to the king of Hungary, John Sepulia, although as we saw, you know, previous functionally, he only controlled part of Hungary since the Ottomans, you know, made it up up the uh, up to Buda, up the Danube to Budapest. Another daughter, Sophia, was married uh, to a German, uh, the guy, uh, the Duke of Brunswick. Another daughter, Anna, uh, stayed, and she would later. Actually, we're going to meet her so later, uh, not in this but in a future reign, papal reign. Uh, another daughter, Catherine, married King John III of Sweden. And the son. Uh, the, uh, the, on, on April 1st, 
1548, Bona's husband, King Sigismund I, died, leaving his his and Bona's eldest son to inherit. Uh, also, he so he became King Sigismund II, King of Poland and Grand Duke of Lithuania. He inherited the unforeseen, malignant consequences of Bona's economic success. Poland and Lithuania then became a target, you know, with all this wealth accruing so quickly, became a target for the expansionist ambition of Ivan III, who's still czar of Russia. He reigned for like 45 years. Now, for all of her talents, uh, Bona, and, and her undeniable contributions to Poland and Lithuania, Queen Bona, I mean, she was human, you know, so made mistakes, and one of them was... She had not made adequate military provisions to guard what was now a far more desirable realm, you know, worth the trouble of, of an invasion. Her son, Sigismund III, learned this the hard way, being defeated repeatedly on the battlefield by Ivan. His solution was the Union of Lublin, L-U-B-L-I-N in Poland, uh, signed on July 1st, 1569. It created a new country, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. At the time, it was one of the largest countries in Europe because Russia was not, uh, not all of Russia that we, we think of going to the Pacific at this point. It was, you know, west of the Urals. Uh, so, you know, it was not as big as we think of it t- today. And uh, it, so this, this Commonwealth replaced the personal union of the crown of the King of Poland and the, and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So now it became a real union with an elected monarchy. So that's another what's going to turn out to be a weakness because, you know, their rivals did not have that. So it'd be an elected monarchy. But anyway, so that's what happened. Uh, all right, so we're going to pause here because next, the next development, set of developments that affect church history and the reign of Gregory the Thirteenth, bring us to France and a continuation of the French wars of religion. And that's the, the Huguenot, you know, the Huguenot issue. So we're going to uh, stop here and we'll pick up at that next time. So seminarians, this will be... Uh, uh, Gregory the 13th, part A, and the Huguenots will be part B. So obviously I have to watch this one first. Thank you for your attention. This session is adjourned.